Hey, friends and clever listeners, it's Amy. We're working our way towards our 200th episode. And in honor of that milestone, we're queuing up a few extra memorable episodes from the archives. Please enjoy this encore presentation. I won't say it's an embarrassment that I should know how to do things, but I prefer not to. There is that freedom in that. I'm fearful of knowing those things. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to Julian Lennon. Yes, that Julian Lennon. The award-winning humanitarian, musician, fine art photographer, best-selling author, filmmaker, and eldest son of Beatle John Lennon. He has spent his life steeped in creativity, honing his unique powers of observation and engaged in multidisciplinary modes of artistry, storytelling, and stewardship. His somewhat solitary youth in North Wales was both wild and free and deeply conflicted. Creativity became an outlet early on, and he has nurtured his talents throughout his life through a multitude of expressions. By 21, he was already a rock star with his first album, Velat, and music has been a constant throughout his life, including hits along the way like Too Late for Goodbyes and Saltwater. Recently, in 2022, he released his seventh studio album, Jude, the name being a reference to his five-year-old self, Paul McCartney's inspiration for the Beatles' Hey Jude. He's been involved in the production of many films and documentaries, including executive producing Women of the White Buffalo and 2020's Kiss the Ground, an acclaimed documentary that makes a compelling and lucid argument for no-till and regenerative farming as a practical and scalable solution for healing our soil, and by extension, our climate, food, and people. As of this recording, it's currently available for streaming on Netflix if you'd like to watch. He's also published a New York Times bestselling trilogy of children's books. He discovered his photographic talent by accident and has leaned into it, developing a signature of arresting and etheric landscapes and raw, candid portraits. He's exhibited widely since his first show, Timeless, in 2010, and recently debuted a collection of breathtaking skyscapes entitled Atmosphere at Freeze LA Art Fair through William Turner Gallery. With all of his multimodal creative output, perhaps the most consistent through line is his environmental and humanitarian efforts through his nonprofit, the White Feather Foundation. Since its inception in 2007, the White Feather Foundation has saved native lands from being taken from indigenous groups, brought clean water to developing communities, and provided girls with educational scholarships, as well as furnished vital equipment and supplies for rural schools. It's an unbelievable journey that has been and continues to be more about the adventure than the destination. Here's Julian. I'm Julian Lennon and I live in Monaco, but I travel around the world a great deal. And I am an artist who works in many mediums and formats. I always like to go back to the beginning. I love to understand the person you are today by also learning about your formative years. What types of things captured your young imagination and fueled your creative growth? A lot of how I've been indirectly guided. When dad walked out the door, it was just mum and I. I was fully supportive in whatever mum wanted to do and tried to help her as best as I could along the way. In my teenage years, and even slightly earlier than that, than that I used to live by the seaside with my mum and my grandmother in a peninsula called the Wirral uh, across the estuary from Liverpool. It's only about 20 minutes away, but it's a very quaint seaside, old school town that remarkably remains pretty much identical today as it did when I was probably about 11 or 12. That is a rarity. Wow. It, it is. I went, I went back to visit it with my dearest and oldest friend, Justin Clayton, who I used to go to school together. We've done world tours together, all of that kind of stuff. And we went back 
pre-COVID, drove up from London and spent a couple of nights up there. And I was expecting the place to look remarkably different, but it it was remarkably the same. (laughs) That must have jogged a few memories loose. I remember playing on the beaches there as a kid, very much walking up and down and going to the old cinema, which also was on the beach. I was inspired a great deal by that because we used to go to the cinema every Saturday morning. It was a thing. But shortly after that, mum moved to North Wales. We basically lived in the middle of the countryside, in the middle of nowhere, for quite a few years. And that had a quite a big impact on me because, I mean, there wasn't a lot of TV back then. We were just about entering the video era, you know, if you taped something off the TV. (laughs) There was obviously no internet and no mobile phone, so you made your own fun. Being on farmland, it was about 12 acres, and I used to work on the neighbouring farm. I used to help with the lambing. I used to do a number of other things, getting food out. Wait, wait, wait. Help with the lambing? When the sheep were having their lambs. You helped the lambs come out. You were the obstetrician for for lambs? (laughs) I mean, I was a kid. I helped out. You know, I was a... I was a hand on the farm and I put the hay out in the middle of winter in snow to, to feed some of the animals out in the, in the wild. But when I wasn't working, I'd be climbing trees like an idiot. I'd be building canoes. Oh, fantastic. Would, would go down rivers. Then I got into motorcycles as an early teenager. Before we get there, though, it sounds like you were living pretty close to the earth. Oh, very much so. Very, very much so. Even if you were high atop in the (laughs) treetops. Yeah, no, I was, I I loved nature. It was an important thing for me to be part of that. And I think it's essential for kids that are growing up to be out in nature to understand what your relationship with it is. I guess that's why many moons later, You know, I've come back to it in a bigger way than ever before, especially with the likes of not only working with the charity uh, that I founded, the White Feather Foundation, where we try and help around the world, but also with independent films like Kiss the Ground, which in of itself has become a platform which is making great change and great strides, slowly but surely, around America and around the world. And, uh, you know, there are plans to have a few follow-up films on that that will enlighten people further as to not only just understand what's really going on, uh, but also to, you know, be able to make some changes, simple changes uh, that can make a great deal of difference. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, that's as important as anything else. Yes, the the air that we breathe is, is polluted, you know, a, a good amount, and the seas are polluted, and the soil's polluted. We can't do everything, but we can certainly do our bit. And definitely my focus, at least with Kiss the Ground and with that team and moving forward, is, is to regenerative uh, farming, looking after the soil, because... With the air and with the sea, if we don't look after it, we're the ones that are screwed. <laughs> you know, the earth will remain. Absolutely. It's the humans who are fucking themselves. <laughs> yes, yes. The earth's just going to spit us off at some point, you know, <laughs> and it'll be fine. Um, and everything else will be fine again. We're idiots, really. We truly, truly are idiots. I hear you. I want to get further into Kiss the Ground as we go into your career trajectory, but I'm really interested in this young child who was birthing lambs and then getting on motorcycles. Well, I was very much a loner, especially in those circumstances. You know, number one, it was not only awkward being the son of a very well-known person, it was problematic beyond because I would have to, when mum was a bit of a nomad, she traveled a lot, she moved a lot. So Uh, And I feel I've done pretty much the same as that, which I love. But, you know, I'd have to go to new schools a fair amount. One of the last ones I went to in North Wales, where they were old school English 
private schools. They would have an assembly in the morning, and if you're new to the school, the headmaster would, you know, say, and we have some new people in, in uh, that are uh, joining us this term, and then they just introduce uh, everybody by name, and and then of course I'd be pointed out. And they would say, "Stand up! This is uh, Julian Lennon. This is John Lennon's son from the Beatles." Oh uh, my gosh! I mean, even at eleven years old, I'd be going, "Really? You had to do that?" That's not fair to a child. That puts undue no, exposure uh, on uh, you. Uh, uh, yeah, and the, from that point on, you know, the trust in people was very difficult to gain because I didn't know why why people liked me. Oh my gosh, what a distortion to grow up in. Oh yeah, that was really messed up. You know, it, it's, as you can tell, it's still a thorn in my side because I, I don't believe there's any excuse for doing that. So a child especially is putting him in a position where he's just screwed. I, I think I came out of there with my one and only best friend that I still have, which is Justin Clayton. That was a tough one, going through a num- number of schools an approach that way by the, the the school and the community. It was annoying, to say the least. I hear you. And I'm sure there people thought they owned a piece of you or they had a right to know you more publicly than anybody else. It pushed me further into quietness and being shy because I, I, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't know who was my friend. I was quite introverted, to say the least. I was quite closed off. It was a quiet youth for the most part, you know. I think it was around that time, probably about 10, 11, that it got started getting pretty weird for me, you know, because of that. I would try and avoid being seen as the son of all being in any circumstance that would allow that to, to come about. Yeah, that would make it difficult to forge your own independent sovereign identity <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's only been over 50 years in the making where I feel some sense of myself, really. And that's why uh, in 2020 I changed my name, which was originally John Charles Julian Lennon. By deed poll, I changed it to Julian because I was tired of being the second John and I felt that I wanted to be Julian. I wanted to be myself after all these years. And so uh, that's partly why I called the album Jude was because it was, I wouldn't say a coming of age, but it was certainly taking ownership of the name Jude and all that that stood for. It's it's a reclamation. Yeah, very much so. I'm just... Well, I'm not sad, but I, I, it, it, that it's taken this long to get there, you know. I've got to say, after leaving the business and coming back to it every kind of 10 years or so, I understand again why I left the business, because <laughs> uh, the, just the entertainment industry in general, I loathe. I really do. I mean, there's some good people in it, obviously, uh, but it's a horrible life, I think. I mean, this, this is why I go on, whether it's long motorcycle rides or if there's an excuse. I mean, I, I love LA. I've got a lot of friends here. I used to live here, but I went up to meet the writers, uh, producers, and directors of Kiss the Ground yesterday who live in Ojai. So any excuse to get in the car, a little mini with the roof off and go, I'm gone. So I love just doing stuff, going places, being outside and doing all of that kind of stuff. I'm just so tired of the industry itself because it always turns your back on you one way or another. Well, the way it's set up, it's very extractive as opposed to regenerative. And very I can so. see that you would just feel so depleted after answering a slew of similar questions in different towns. After going around in circles with the promo on this, this album, a year or two ago when I did some promotional work for my photography, you know, we were doing some very interesting interviews at that time. We would generally discuss with most magazines all of life and why and how things are interconnected one way or another. And when I went back to the whole music thing, they didn't care about anything else. They didn't care about the New York Times best-selling children's books. They didn't care about Kiss the Ground. It was borderline on the verge of being offered up for an Oscar. The White Feather Foundation 
all the other stuff that I do. They don't care about any of that. Doesn't make any sense to me since you can hear it woven throughout all of your music. All of this stuff. It's it, you're multi-dimensional creative, and everything is related. Yeah, I learned this lesson even uh, even harder when literally over the last year have not been able to get on any late night talk show, not to either talk nor perform. I've offered myself up so that I can speak about whatever anybody wants to ask me because I have a lot to talk about in regards to the work I've done over the last five years and more. I can't get arrested. So I'm like, why am I being blocked? Or do I have to dumb down my situation? Do I have too much to talk about? What's the deal? You know, I just at the end of the day and all of the end of all this promo, I'm going, this gives me anxiety, it, it stresses me out. I don't understand why I'm in the situation I'm in when I've got nothing but love and much more to offer on so many levels and to talk about. But this is why I've kind of decided literally in, in, the, in the past month that I've just decided I'm just going to get on with the creative work now and screw everything else and be happy in that process. Sounds like you've made a few like really heavy duty life decisions in the last few months. Well, I think that's the only way I can be happy. It's basically the idea that just believe in yourself and your work and your art and your creativity and just get on with it and lead a happy life. You know, and I've I've been at that happy place before and I really really enjoyed it. But then when you have to kind of try and prove yourself by going out into the media and doing all that stuff. That's where the ugliness of it all comes into play. I just don't like it. And I and now I understand so much why people pull out of it because it's just it's it's not a pleasant place to be. You know, it's a different situation if you're uh, part of the A team, you know, you 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 the Taylor Swifts this that and the other, but anybody beneath that, it's 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 a graph. I, I used to love playing live. I had considered it for later this year. But there's a lot of stress and anxiety behind that too. For one, I have the worst memory of anybody I know. I'm not a practicing musician. I only play to write when it feels natural. So I write, I record and produce the work. And I work with a lot of other people too on their projects too, but not a lot is known about that. After I've written, recorded and produced it and put it on tape, I forget about it. I kind of move on to the next project, whatever that is, whether it's music or photography or otherwise. And so to come back to it, you know, a lot of people say, oh, there's a guitar, you know, can you play something? And I'll go, no. <laughs> Literally, I cannot play you something. I don't remember how I wrote what I wrote when I wrote it. And that goes for the lyrics too. So for me to even come close to rehearsing for a tour, of seven albums. That's a nightmare for me. But the other thing is, you'd be lucky to break even these days, unless you're one of the megas, you know. You'd have to really, really love playing live to want to do that, to just break even uh, after slogging yourself on the road. But also, again, for me, I, I, you know, because I have all these other little careers now, it's a timing thing as well. So I love too much of the other stuff that I'm doing now. Maybe I'll do it further down the road. It would really be about the love of playing live again. I, I don't have that enough within to consider that right now. But what I am strangely doing, I have a dear friend who lives close to me, who's a great singer-songwriter, and he plays all the bars, the clubs, the restaurants. You know, That's how he makes a living up and down the coast of France and Italy. It's not a bad gig, you know, so... He works his hiney off, no question about that. He's a really, he's a grafter. But I've asked him if I can pull him aside, give him a little money and in his time off to teach me his favorite 10, maybe 20 songs. So that could be from Bob Marley to maybe Dylan, maybe a few others, a real mix. And I'm going to graft at being able to do that in between everything else. Just to see if I, you know, once I've learned this stuff, if I enjoy it. And then actually when he goes out doing his gig, I'll sit in unnamed as a, you know, guitarist and backing singer for him. And I want to see if that sparks that life and that enjoyment again. 
That sounds actually like a really interesting experiment, especially if you're in stealth mode. People don't know who you are, so there's no expectation. You're playing covers, so it's not about whether they like your music or not. And it's really about, do I like connecting with the audience? Do I like this sort of transitory creativity that is renewed every night, which can be destabilizing or regenerating, depending on how you metabolize it? But you wouldn't have that information if you were touring in support of Jude. I like this experiment. Keep me posted. Yeah. Yeah. So this is to know whether I still have that love inside of of that connection. I know when I'm up there and I'm confident, I do, no question about it. But again, I just haven't done it for a long time. And I feel so settled and comfortable being behind the camera and being behind the scenes that it's really a place I, I can enjoy and I can breathe. I can do all the creative stuff without that anxiety and tension that knot in my stomach that I always, you know, even thinking about it, I start, oh, you know, I, I, I have panic stations um, where, where with everything else that I love, creatively speaking, you know, it's just a joy to do. Like It really, really is. And uh, that's where my head is going anyway. It's much more into the photography in the future. I uh, just had a great, well, it's still on, a great exhibition in Santa Monica. Yes, Atmosphere at William Turner Gallery. Yeah, which the response has been fantastic. I mean, the photos are just arresting. They take your breath away. Well, thank you. The weird thing is that, you know, I thought as a photographer, at least in the traditional sense, it was much more about, you know, being a guerrilla photographer in many respects. You know, if I was considering a collection, we'd be talking anywhere between 20 images, maybe 30, 40, I mean, 50. The biggest collection I did was one called Cycle, which I showed around the world and was able to really do a great uh, show at the Leica Gallery here in LA. And that was pretty special too. And a lot of my earlier f- photographs was no- were known as painterly, you know, because they were just soft clouds. And, and I loved all that stuff. But I thought as a photographer, I should be more focused. I should be storytelling. I should be doing all of that kind of stuff. And I, I, and I have done to a certain degree. With Cycle was about the cycle of life in the South China Seas how people survived. And then you have Charlene Whitstock, who uh, became Princess Charlene of Monaco, you know, behind the scenes, stuff like that. And I love all of that too. But I always kind of wanted to get into the more artistic side of of that stuff. And I'd never really worked on uh, on such a big scale before either. My love initially at school was being an artist. Before music, my medium was really pastels that's that's what what i loved yeah were you figurative or were you abstract or how were you expressing uh, no, figurative, yourself in pastel? figurative for the most part but i i did wander off a little bit because i found with that particular medium you could obviously blend which is what i loved is that you could fuse anything and everything in that medium This is all making sense. Your photographs also kind of have that kind of ethereal quality. But your life does too, because you're blending all of these different creative pursuits. They all bleed into one another. Yeah, and aside from that, then I fell in love with cooking. (laughs) Uh, And I really was considering going after being a chef at one point, because when I first moved out of my home with mum, you know, I had like a five pounds a week, which I guess would have been maybe seven, eight dollars back in the day. And I survived on Heinz beans on toast for a very, very long time uh, until I got very sick and tired of Heinz beans on toast. Still love them occasionally, though. (laughs) Memories, good cup of tea, builder's tea and beans on toast. Mum started showing me, oh, you know, throw some onions in there and some different spices. And I'm like, ah. Yeah, yeah. So I started learning about blending on the food side. So majority of the food that I make now is fusion in many respects. Uh, some traditional stuff, but nothing follows a recipe. And I've been involved in several restaurants and still am. Oh, in what, what capacity? I was a partner in a, in a restaurant that did very well back in the day, but what killed us off was actually the writer's strike and the financial crash in 2007 and eight. 
where we couldn't afford to pay the rent anymore. Nobody was coming to, and this was at our kind of, kind of flagship one out here in LA. It's a, a restaurant called Blowfish, sushi to die for. Anyway, we, <laughs> my partner Jason and uh, our partner Ritsu, the chef, they are uh, looking to open up in Dubai. And I, I never thought I, you know, I just didn't see, I didn't feel I had any interest in Dubai. I didn't have a connection with that place, but maybe this will show me something different. But my partner Jason says he, he loves it out there. So I'm going, all right, well, I'll come visit. And we'll see how things go. During COVID, we were actually uh, making up recipes for another new restaurant venture we were going to do, but COVID killed that as well. But um, one thing at a time. Well, I was going to ask you about that, like the gear shifting that you do, shifting between all these different projects, all these, you must have so many irons in the fire and balls in the air at one time. How do you navigate? I like that list. You know, I was in the music business, still am to a degree, for over 30 years, you know. That's why I happily moved on to photography came into play and then documentary work came in and and then the children's books and the White Feather Foundation. So I like to move, you know, it's like for me sitting on a beach, give me about 20 minutes and I'm twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like if I arrive in a new city or a new location, I'm going to rent a car, look at the map once, get lost and find my way around and know the city after a few days. I can't sit still. I have to absorb and learn and sense the place emotionally and and by food as well, of course, you know. So, you know, I don't think I've traveled enough, to be honest with you. And when I did, it was mostly on tour and that was in the back of a bus or a plane and the, the hotel and the gig and and it, that was that cycle of life. Right. You don't have your own schedule to go exploring, really. Yeah, well, that was fun in your 20s and 30s, but we were all a bit mad back then. You know, we just <laughs> wanted to get mad. <laughs> we, we, we weren't really overly interested in the cultural experience of the locations we were going to. So I love moving. I love traveling. I love driving. I love discovering. My ambition is to travel a lot more. So I was going to ask you about your your photography and travel. Is it the travel that informs the photography or do you does the photography inform the travel? Partly how this started was you going on trips for the White Feather Foundation. Who would align we have aligned ourselves and learned a lot from organizations like uh, Charity Water, Scott Harrison. It's like he, he was the one that said, come on out to Ethiopia. And I'd never been on any kind of trip like that ever before. So at the same time, we were talking to the UN about their Millennium Village projects. And so because I was going to be in the same continent, I aligned that with going to Kenya before meeting up with Scott in Ethiopia. So in Kenya, I did a series of photographs of the schools that we visited, the health clinics, and all the issues that they were facing. And that's where the Cynthia Lennon Scholarship for Girls came out of that trip, because uh, I learned so much that's just not in everyday education. You really don't hear about other countries enough in the news, especially in America, more than probably any other country in the world. They shy away from from information from the rest of the world, which is really sad because, I mean, I, I'd have to hear from friends or even online if I'm looking at something else because I was thinking of going to New Zealand where I've never been. I've seen so many shows and know quite a few people from out there, and it's so stunning, so beautiful. I'm afraid that if I go there, I'll never come back. So I, I was thinking about heading out there for my upcoming birthday. And my friend who lives out there, she said, uh, Jules, uh, have you not heard about the cyclone and the flooding and everything and the deaths that have been going on here? I said, what? I think you have to move around to find out what's real or not these days, half of the time. Certainly those trips to Kenya and then Ethiopia really opened my eyes. You know, you think traveling through Europe or whatever is enough. It's never enough. I can't wait to go back. I, I just want to explore more and more and more. But the world 
can be quite a scary place, no question about that. And you want to be organized, I think at least, and safe with, with one's travel where you're going. That's why if you can do trips like that with organizations or NGOs already in place that you feel safe and secure with and that they know the area, and that it's much more comfortable to be able to do that because, again, as quite a shy person initially, I still have to push myself out the door with, with some of the anxieties that I've had over the years. I've always had anxiety to a degree, but this the last year or so has been really full on. Why do you think that is? It's all the unknowns, even the idea of touring and playing. I can't breathe sometimes. I get to this point where I I can't leave the house. I can't deal with people. And it's tied into depression as well. And I've I've had my fair share of that crap too. But I've been working through all of that for the most part. But every once in a while, I get hit hard by it. And I think you just have to ride it through for the most part. I mean, there's certain things you can do, like, move, get out, exercise, breathe. And so I, I, I make that much more of a core thing in my in my life these days. I go power walking at least three times a week for anywhere, you know, five, ten kilometers just to get out, but I take the camera because, you know, whether it's down by the sea or up in the mountains, I'll either go in my little convertible mini or I'll go on the motorbike so I'm getting fresh air at the same time, even if I don't get a proper walk in. So I, I have to do that minimum once a week just to get out. Uh, just even, to stay even centered. If, yeah, even if I'm okay, you know, I'll just go, no, got to get out. I've spent too much time doing this or editing photographs or any, any number of, uh, of things that takes my attention away from being outside, being in nature, seeing the sun, feeling the sun on my face or the breeze or the chill with the walk. All of that has become very, very important. And I notice that a lot of people feel really feel the same way, that not that they're shutting down, they're just escaping. In some ways, the pandemic did us all a service because we had to confront mental health and unhealthy habits and productivity habits that we were already in society. And then the pandemic made it worse, so we had to confront it. And a lot of people went, I'm just not going to live that way anymore. And I'm not going to power through my anxiety. I'm going to I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to care for myself. And I'm going to do what I need to do so that life isn't such a Chit show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it did all predominantly come in about. I mean, I was in uh, in Monaco and in, uh, in France during the pandemic, and yeah, you know, there were a few places around the world where they were pretty strict. And you know, you weren't allowed out the house for more than an hour. You'd have a piece of paper, so you were allowed outside in a one kilometer area. You were allowed out only for an hour. You had to say what you were going outside for, food or a walk or this or whatever. Where I have a summer home at the moment is is probably a couple of hundred yards from the sea. It's not on the sea. There's a main road in between. I mean, this is what I don't understand with the pandemic especially is that, you know, they said, no, you can't go. You can't sit on the beaches and get some fresh air. So half of my one kilometer circle was in the sea. So I had half a kilometer uh, to be able to go outside for months and months and months. That was a weird one. I was on my own, very, very isolated. You know, scared, not really not knowing what was going to happen. Having no idea if we we were going to get out out of this. I, I was concerned at first for the first, you know, few weeks. But after I settled into the peace and quiet and just hearing the birds outside and just hearing water you know, the wind in the trees. I I very much fell in love with nature again. You know, this is where it all comes full circle again. That was really quite beautiful for a while because I just eased into there is no choice here. There is no escape. So do what you can in the moment. And so that's when I began to breathe. That's when I began to meditate in many respects I do photography editing probably or work up proposals and projects. Uh, I'd still FaceTime my manager, Rebecca, out in LA. We'd look forward to our weekly chats on on a Friday. So that was Friday (laughs) night. Um, um, (laughs) But also, you know, it was amazing because I I hated the idea of doing Zooms. And she said, Jules, listen, it's really important. You've got to have this one meeting with 
five people that you don't know. And once this is all over, it could make a big difference in how we move forward with certain projects. I really hated the idea initially. And then I saw, you know, execs of this company and that company almost in their pajamas with terrible <laughs> lighting. Um, yeah. And you saw uh, their, like, bookshelves and, uh, and, and I clutter. Thought it was fan-fucking-tastic. I, <laughs> fe- I fell in love with doing it. I said, no, we're not doing a, a phone call. We're doing Zoom or we're doing FaceTime. I want to see these motherfuckers. No, because... <laughs> What it really did was it put you on a level playing field in, in, in such a nice new way because previous to that, I'd been out to LA and we were meeting certain you know uh, agencies, this, that, and the other. And you had to go to the desk and you had to show your ID and then they'd give you a sticker saying who the fuck you are. And then you'd wait downstairs and you'd be told to get, be escorted up to the top floor and then you'd be put in the waiting room up there while and you'd eventually get to see the person you wanted to see and this way you just went boom and you saw them looking disheveled terrible (laughs) in their own homes with their terrible interior designs and uh, and and i found that fascinating and i basically just started taking the piss out of them really And I enjoyed the whole process of meeting people again that way. At at that point, I started to reconnect with uh, quite a few old friends that I hadn't seen or heard from in years and was really slightly older friends that I was worried if they were okay or not, you know. And then that became the new medium, you know, of connecting with friends once a week, uh, you know, lifting each other up if we were a bit down. And that was a great help moving forward. Well, we could also be a lot more honest with each other about if we were down. Previously, we would have had to, you know, get in touch, have a phone call, and we'd kind of have to just celebrate the good stuff we're doing in life. I I was very much about being honest, should I say. So that, you know, how are you feeling? Well, I feel like shit, you know, and I'm scared and I'm lonely. Your friend would next week, he'd be stronger and I'd be the weaker one, you know. And it was, I thought that was a great opening. It was a great new way to relate and breathe to people in a way that probably should be doing anyway in normal life, you know, just be fucking honest, you know. So that was kind of special. And then when, of course, the barriers did open up and we could travel again. I'd met uh, an incredible artist. She's she's become one of my best friends. Uh, she's a painter and sculptor. And she decided to move. She's from Belgium. She decided to rebuild a ninth century tower in a tiny little town up in the mountains behind Cannes. She's an amazing interior designer too. So I, I said, well, uh, let, me come, uh, let me come and say hi. So I'd gone to visit her in this ninth century mid- medieval town in the middle of nowhere, but I'd gone on the main, mostly the main roads. And after a couple of visits, I, I said, I want to find the other ways that I can get to you. So I don't want to go to the normal roads anymore. So I looked at a map and said, okay, if I go up that way and then I'll just find my way across. I'd been living in this area for 24 years or whatever it is. And... You know, I knew some beautiful spots, but I'd never really gone that far. I'd go, oh, well, that looks interesting. So I'd, I'd go, and I discovered plateaus on top of mountains that were so bloody gorgeous with, oh, with God knows how old the little chapel was. That was it in the middle with one road down the whole of this plateau in this valley. And then I would find glacial lakes where there was nobody. Nobody. And we're talking turquoise blue lakes with trees and rocks. and Nobody. If you did the short version, it was maybe an hour, 40, 50 minutes, maybe two hours. But I would, I would find all these new trips up in the mountains. And I'd been there for almost 25 years, and I knew nothing about these things. So getting out again and, and, and just breathing and trying new roads, <laughs> roads less travels. I, I was fully blown away. And that just shows me there's so much more to discover, even locally for me. A, a day away and you're in, it feels like you're in another country. It really, really does. So I, I'm even trying to push getting out and about even more than, than, I, than I ever used to 
before. You know, it's just magical, magical. And people say, oh, you're surrounded by such beauty. You'd... I'm going, yeah, I go and find it. I don't sit at home doing this. You know, get in your car, get on a bike, go walking, do whatever. It's out there. You just got to go and get it. Well, and the beautiful thing about having done that a few times is it restores your sense of discovery. You you start to remember, oh, there's a lot out there that I just haven't found yet. And then that gets your curiosity fired up and you start to look forward to it in ways that, you know, is life affirming. It's also the beauty that surrounds you that, you know, that you really do see again what is just around the corner, you know. Uh, again, it's like me when I'm in L.A., I think I probably know the Santa Monica Mountains more than most people who live here. Because at least once a week, I will get in the mini, roof down, and I will find new roads until there are none to be discovered in that spot. Uh, and I do it at least once a week, as I said. And I, you know, I, I do it so I catch the sunset north of Malibu. It's just beautiful. But I make the effort to, to, to find it. Give me an excuse, as I said, to go somewhere and I'll do it. Uh, I, I'd rather have that than sit around, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, you sound like an explorer at heart and also a bit of an anthropologist um, in addition to being connected to nature. The funny thing is there was an event in Portugal and Lisbon, which I'd never been to before quite a few years ago, where the Explorers Club had an event called GLEX or GLEX, I'd just done a new 25th anniversary version of Saltwater, a song that's well known with me. It was num number one in Australian, brother. And they asked me to come along, and I thought, okay, it'd be nice. I've never been to Lisbon. It's a couple of days. Uh, they're going to host me. Um, and I knew one person out there as well who was, a, who was an, uh, an art dealer. So I went out there, and it was taking place in a big theatre. It was like TED Talks, but for, for the Explorers Club. And I thought I was going to have, it would be like being back in school. I couldn't wait to get out of, you know, be a naughty <laughs> boy and get out the back door. But I f absolutely fell head over heels in love with all that was going on and m the majority of the, the speakers there. Because it was like the new guard that was coming in, the younger, braver. Not that they, the earlier folks in the Explorers Club weren't brave, no question about that, but this was a fresh start. This was a new, a new group coming in with new wisdom, a new understanding of we can fix things. And so I fell in love with the Explorers Club. And what they did was it was a 2,500-seat theatre, I think, and they, they wanted me to come up and sign books for all the kids of the Explorers on stage, which was a bit weird, but anyway... <laughs> The thing was, it was one of those huge screens behind, and they played the new video for Saltwater, which had astronauts in it, that had deep sea diving, had the yellow submarine in it, you know. So all of the subject matter that was being discussed about life on planet Earth and the world around us was in the video. And so that was played in front of all the, the speakers and their families at the end of the event. And then we, we went backstage and we talked to all the speakers, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I said, I'd love to be an explorer. And they, they said, you are an explorer in your own way uh, because you're spreading the word through books, through songs, through videos, through documentaries, through the White Feather Foundation. So uh, we'd love to have you on board as an explorer. Uh, so I'm now part of the Explorers Club. Well, congratulations. I can see the twinkle in your eye. That, that, so, you found yeah, your tribe. I, I, well, the idea is to get back into that travel and discovery and to really discover how far I can push that and, and, uh, and go out into a world that I know very little about, in all honesty. I'm excited to be able to get into that world again. So when you do go exploring and you absorb all of this new information about the world because it's a new place that you haven't been or it's a discovery, I'm, I'm assuming you have your camera with you, but like, do you digest it? And then does it tell you what kind of creative output it wants to be, whether it's a photograph or a documentary or it comes through and you're writing for a children's book? How do you metabolize this inspiration? 
Well, regardless, I think what would be a good thing for you to watch if you haven't seen it is a little video that we did for the Restoration Hardware RH collection of photographs. It's just a little video. You can actually find it on my probably on my Facebook uh, and or Instagram. And it just describes that if I see something that inspires me or grabs me in some way, I have to take a picture of it. I, I don't have a choice. For whatever reason, I do that. I may not get the story across or the meaning of it at that particular point in time, but I tend to find that when I'm editing. I've realized that I'm not really a photographer. I, I capture images, yes, but it's in the editing that I will find a story or the story I'm meant to find or, or that I'm looking for. Because you can see the, the pattern. You, you have a macro view of it at that point. I can breathe at that point, whereas normally, you know, even shots with some collection, a lot of pictures will be taken in the back of a truck just on a whim like that. I don't know if I've got that picture properly or I can use that until I get back. Like the Princess Charlene pictures, I was taken on by Vogue.com to get pictures to them after, directly after the wedding. And it was a very small space with the hairdresser, the hairdresser's assistants, the makeup person, the makeup person's assistants, clothing. The, so it was so many people. And Princess Charlene Whitstock at that point in time was... I think in shock that she was about to become a princess, you know, and her life was going to change dramatically forever, you know. And she was 50-50 at once asking me to be there. She was 50-50 as to whether she wanted me to be there. <laughs> and I said, listen, this is a moment in time that is really special, really unique. There'll be no other like it. I'll stay out of your way. I promise you I'll be a fly on the wall. Anyway, I just shot what I could. It was chaos. It was mayhem in these rooms with people doing this. And I had no idea. And so I got back home, which was about 15 minutes away, and I immediately put them up on the screen, and I look at the images, and I, and I just go, I've got nothing. Fuck, 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 fuck. And this <laughs> happens with every collection that I do. And there was one thing she, she asked me to do, which I'm sure it's okay to mention now. She said, none of the pictures can be seen with me smoking or having a glass of champagne. Can't do it, okay? Got to promise. Okay. And Vogue said, listen, we need definitely need one of her smiling. Um, I'm going, okay. The only picture in the whole collection of hundreds that I had that where she was smiling was she was sitting back in a chair with a, with a ciggy and a glass of champagne. <laughs> you know, like, it was like a Vogue shoot. It was like a meant to be. And I'm going, oh, God. I go, okay, what do I do? All right, let me get rid of the cigarette. How do I defeat the champagne? Black and white. But let me just desaturate, not full black and white, because I, I tend to make every collection slightly different. I desaturated it, and I cropped it in a certain way, and I went, oh, my God. I said, fuck, Jesus, think, think of the 30s, 40s, 50s. Think of Grace Kelly. Th think of the old Hollywood times, the rainy uh, and yes. And immediately I, I it went. Evo it, they do evoke that. So that's exactly what I did. I batched desaturation across it and then went in and edited it so it gave it a particular framing. Um, and some of those images are some of the favorite I've ever, the, the most favorite I've ever t taken. I, I, I think she's stunning in a few of them and with the movement of the hairdressers around and people changing and the, the patterns and shapes that are going on in all of that. You know what's stunning about them too is you manage to capture a stillness within the chaos. Yeah, very much so. Very, it was her world right there. And I think that's what I love to do in the visual art, so to speak, whether that's uh, Kiss the Ground or photography, is, is finding that moment, finding a connection there that, uh, again, at the time, I don't know if I've made that connection. It's only when I get back in the, in the editing chair and, and really kind of go... With every collection I brought home, I've gone, what is this? You know, and I have to find that communication, that message, that story 
in every photograph. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That makes a lot of sense. It's like when you're shooting the photo, you're just capturing raw material. I'm in the middle of the madness too, because again, I'm not a pro photographer. I don't know what I'm doing. As long as I get something, then I can work <laughs> with that later, you know. You know, I still don't know how to operate a camera properly. I hate to say it being that man thing where you refuse to read a manual. But I think that also relates back to the magic for me, because if I knew what I was doing half the time, it wouldn't happen. And this is why going back to the music thing also is that I used to write these quite elaborate 20 minute instrumental pieces on piano. One of my first loves was Keith Jarrett, clone concert is one of my all time favorites. And I love Steely Dan and lots of bands like that. Yeah. I love the rock and roll and the heavy stuff too, but uh, the heart of hearts, I love chord changes that just gave me goosebumps. And Keith Jarrett was full of that, especially the clone concert, and also Steely Dan and a number of other bands like that. But, and so I used to play these pieces, but just by ear, you know, and it was actually a recorded one uh, in my studio in L.A. probably 25 years ago. Herbie Hancock came by and I said, listen, could you play this piece properly? I said, well, that's why you're here. <laughs> so he's listening to what I played, and he's going, what is that chord? I'm going, <laughs> you're asking me what that chord is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. He said, Jules, you really need to learn how to read and write music so you can communicate this stuff to other musicians. I, I got his point, and yes, there's one side of me that wishes I did, and I could have, and I'd be in a different place now potentially musically if I did that, but it wouldn't have allowed for other expressions like photography and or anything else, I don't think. And so I, I like not knowing what I'm doing because if I, as I said, if I knew it, it would all be over. So every time I come to the idea of writing a new song, it's all discovery again, you know, because I don't play the piano in between or play the guitar in between. So I'm relearning it every bloody time. Of course, there's a core memory for some of the basic, basic stuff. But the stuff that I really love, which is all a bit like that, is what I truly, truly love. So I'm up. that's what keeps me interested in music. But that causes a problem with the live stuff again. You know, I can't just get up and play something. But that's the trade-offs. So. I can see how animated you become when you talk about the discovery process in the process of composing. And the fact that you don't know the rules means you also don't have to adhere to them. You don't have to unlearn anything. And you also don't even know if you're breaking them. You're just going where you want to go with it. That There's a real liberation to that. Yeah, yeah. But I won't say it's an embarrassment that I should know how to do things but I prefer not to. There is that freedom in that. I'm fearful of knowing those things, which is a weird place to be. There's a case to be made for knowing things can kind of close your world down a little bit. I know there's an argument for both sides, and I'm not advocating that, you know, never to become a master in certain things, but I do see what you're saying. Like, you, you leave the world wide open for yourself. Correct. It's like ignorance is bliss to a degree. <laughs> You deliberately don't have a roadmap. Oh, that makes so much sense. How I work in any medium is organically with projects. If something comes along and it feels right, I go with it. Uh, obviously, there's the legalities of it all, and that's why I have a wonderful manager now that protects me in that regard. But oh, the reality is that if it feels right and it's a, a happy process moving forward, then regardless whether that's charity or otherwise. Because if I can move with a certain amount of emotion on that, regardless of what that is, then, then I, I'm happier about that. There has to be a level of emotion attached to what I do. If you can't feel it, there's no point in doing it. It's flat, it's dead. You can't make yourself do it. I totally get that. I'm also wondering, it sounds like you have a very sort of finely calibrated internal compass. I, I try. Do you feel like you're a sensitive person? Like, do you pick up on other people's energy and emotion? Oh, completely. And From the second, literally. I'm emotionally driven. And if I feel any negativity or just doesn't feel right, I'm not going there. It's that simple. I've gone down that road before where, 
you know, I've trusted people on, on a number of levels. And, and at the end of the, the, the day, found out I should have just listened to my gut. And so that's all I do these days. I don't want to do anything that doesn't feel right. I also think I learned that from mum, really, with all the crap that she had to live with and through in her life. And uh, she got a fair bit of use and abuse, you know, so I observed all of that. But you have to find your own way. At least I feel much more in tune these days than I ever have before. And I certainly want to be less regretful and happier moving forward. That's my aim, is that that's what my life should be if I can make it as happy as possible. And so that means cutting out any of the the negativities. You need part of that to a degree, but I want to make it predominantly being in a good, balanced, happier place. That's my agenda uh, moving forward. And if that means dealing less with certain situations, then so be it. Well, congratulations. Those are bold decisions to make and not everyone gets there. The thing is, I've been there before, but I've lost it. It's almost uh, being in a position of not caring. Of course you care, but it's just that level where you don't let your surroundings affect you in that way where it could disrupt your peace of mind and your own version of balance in life, you know. Yeah. Just to share a brief personal story of mine, the one time I sort of experienced what I think you're referring to was after a, a kind of stack of traumas, somebody died who was very close to me and I was grieving that death and then also a bunch of other life stuff just sort of piled on. And I remember the heaviness of the grief made everything else so much lighter. It shifted everything into perspective in a way that I remember going to work and thinking like, I was like on top of my game because I didn't give a fuck about any of the other little stuff and other people and their little attitudes and the shit that they were incompetent at. And I was just doing my thing. And I was like, actually, this is the way it should be. Like I was in flow. And it feels very fleeting, though. It feels hard to grasp that. I've had that once or twice. And when, you, when you're in that place, it's, it's quite magical. It's like you're almost in a bit of a dream. And it's not necessarily judging people, but you just you just don't bother with it because it's not relevant. It just doesn't matter. And you can't let that outside stuff get to you, you know, because, I mean, I have for years and years, and it's a painful place to be. It's a, it's a dark place. It's a sad place. And people can do that to you. You know, they can really just corner you and put you in a dark place. And I just, I just had enough at breaking point. But... I, I've never been one to give up, that's for sure. And I think that's been part of my core. There's a saying that my mum used to live on an island called the Isle of Man, and it's between England and Ireland. Uh, the flag, the logo, for, is three legs coming out from a centre. Their little saying, which is very, very quaint, whichever way you throw me, I will always end up standing. That's pretty great. I've always kind of taken that on board, not not going to take it lying down. It's really more about boundaries and making decisions around your own destiny. Doesn't mean about hurting anybody else, but maybe not people pleasing. Well, that's the other thing. I, you know, I did that for too many years too. And e even last year, you know, with all the album promo, and I'm just like, you know what? It doesn't make any fucking difference. It really, do. they don't fucking give a shit anyway. You know, they really <laughs> don't. So... Just get on with your happiness. That's what I say. Get on with your happiness. Get on with the creativity and the love that you find. That's my way forward. That's my mantra. That is a beautiful mantra, a beautiful way forward. When you're looking forward, what brings you joy? What's on the horizon that brings you joy? Well, I, ha I have to say I haven't been in a relationship for a long, long time just because I haven't met that person. I love meeting new people, though. I love meeting new friends, like-minded friends, creatives. That inspires me. And that's why travel inspires me, because you do meet incredible people along the way. I mean, I can say a number of things. You know, cooking for friends, you know, that kind of thing, sharing time with people. Uh, I think discovery with people is great. Travel with people is great also. That's what I aspire to on a number of levels, obviously camera in hand. But would you like to find that person you can share your life with? 
Of course, absolutely. I've been in a couple of great relationships, but for a number of different reasons, they just haven't worked out. But I'm hoping that that'll happen at some point. I mean, it's been a long time, but I'm not one that plays around. I just, it doesn't, I can't do that. It's just not in me to do that. I, I like a connection. You know, I want that best friend, that partner in crime. I'm very close with a couple of friends, very, very good friends, but just not the whole. But in the meantime, all, all else is pretty good. And I tell you what bothers me the most, although sometimes it is necessary, but uh, schedules. <laughs> Although I will be there on time, if not before. <laughs> yes. It, it's, like the, it's like this thing with me, which is, you know. You don't wake. like rules and roadmaps. You like, to, you like to do your own thing when you want to do it and how you want to do it. But I do it uh, uh, to the best of my ability when I do do it. But I, th I think there's a logic to that because it allows me to breathe and have time to make the best of what I'm trying to do. Well, one thing that I have a personal pet peeve with is that so much of society in the world is framed around trying to sort of squeeze as much creative output out of creatives as they can, but it doesn't happen on a standard nine to five productivity schedule. Not unless you're pushing out the same old shit. Right. But you have to absorb, you have to process, you have to maybe even put it away for a while and let it marinate and then bring it back out. And that all happens unpredictably on a very unpredictable schedule. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to allow for that or else you're going to fall into that formulaic rhythm of cranking out the same old shit. Yeah. The end of the last promo that I was doing, which was two and a half months here in, in, in LA. I mean, it was to the edge got to a point where I said, this, I've got to stop this now. I have not been able to breathe. I have not had time off. I said, listen, don't make me hate this because <laughs> if, you do, if you do, I won't come back. This will be the last time. And in, in reality, <laughs> it probably is the last time <laughs> that, that I'll go that deep into, into that kind of promotion again. You know, I'll put stuff out there and say, here you go. Like it or leave it. That's it. Onwards, next project, please. Well, I love that you are spreading your talents through so many endeavors, including, you know, philanthropy, humanitarian. I think I've only just started, really, to be honest with you. That's great. If I can get the support to do all the projects I'd like to do, it's just the beginning, you know. That's the difficult thing, finding that support behind you. But again, there are things that don't need any support. So onwards and upwards. Well, you seem very engaged with life, and I totally encourage you to continue on this trajectory of doing things on your own terms and editing out all the stuff that makes it unpleasant, not fun, or where you can't breathe. Indeed. Been there, done that. Thank you so much for uh, sharing so much of yourself with me today. I feel, like, I feel like we made a connection. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Julian, including images of his work and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you can think of three people who would be inspired by this episode or Clever, please share it with them. It really helps us out. You can listen to Clever on any of the podcast apps. Please do hit the follow or subscribe button in your app of choice so our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com so you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Ilana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows.